you will hear a man phoning a woman about an advertisement he has seen in the paper for some furniture. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello? Oh, hello. I'm ringing about the advertisement in yesterday's newspaper, the one for the bookcases. Can you tell me if they're still available? We've sold one, but we still have two available. Right. Um, can you tell me a bit about them? Sure. Um, what do you want to know? Well, I'm looking for something to fit in my study. So, well, I'm not too worried about the height, but the width's quite important. Can you tell me how wide each of them is? They're both exactly the same size. Let me see. I've got the details written down somewhere. Yes. So they're both 75 centimetres wide and 180 centimetres high. OK, fine. That should fit in OK. And I don't want anything that looks too severe. Not made of metal, for example. I was really looking for something made of wood. That's all right. They are, both of them. So are they both the same price as well? No, the first bookcase is quite a bit cheaper. It's just £15. We paid £60 for it just five years ago, so it's very good value. It's in perfectly good condition. Well, they're both in very good condition, in fact. But the first one isn't the same quality as the other one. It's a good, sturdy bookcase. It used to be in my son's room, but it could do with a fresh coat of paint. Oh, it's painted? Yes, it's cream at present. But as I say, you could easily change that if you wanted. To fit in with your colour scheme. Yes, I'd probably paint it white if I got it. Let's see, what else? How many shelves has it got? Six. Two of them are fixed, and the other four are adjustable, so you can shift them up and down according to the sizes of your books. Right, fine. Well, that certainly sounds like a possibility. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. But the second one's a lovely bookcase too. That's not painted, it's just the natural wood colour, dark brown. It was my grandmother's, and I think she bought it sometime in the 1930s. So I'd say it must be getting on for 80 years old. So it's very good quality. They don't make them like that nowadays. And you said it's the same dimensions as the first one? Yes. And it's got the six shelves, but it also has a cupboard at the bottom that's really useful for keeping odds and ends in. Right. Oh, and I nearly forgot to say, the other thing about it is it's got glass doors, so the books are all kept out of the dust. So it's really good value for the money. I'm really sorry to be selling it, but we just don't have the room for it. Hmm. So what are you asking for that one? Ninety-five pounds. It's quite a bit more, but it's a lovely piece of furniture. A real heirloom. Yes. All the same, it's a lot more than I wanted to pay. I didn't really want to go above 30 or 40. Anyway, the first one sounds fine for what I need. Just as you like. So, 
Is it all right if I come round and have a look this evening? Then, if it's okay, I can take it away with me. Of course. So you'll be coming by car, will you? I've got a friend with a van, so I'll get him to bring me round. If you can just give me the details of where you live. Sure. I'm Mrs. Blake. B L A K E. That's right. And the address is Forty One Oak Rise. That's in Stanton. Okay. So I'll be coming from the town centre. Can you give me an idea of where you are? Yes. You know the road that goes out towards the university. Yes. Well, you take that road, and you go on till you get to a roundabout. Go straight on. Then Oak Rise is the first road to the right. Out towards the university, past the roundabout, first left. First right, and we're at the end of the road. Got it. So I'll be round at about seven, if that's all right. Oh, and my name's Connor, Connor Field. Fine. I'll see you then, Connor. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hi, Joanna. What's the matter? You look a bit depressed. Hi, Kamal. I've just been reading this article in the newspaper about how difficult it is for sociology students to get a job after they graduate. They always want people with work experience. How do you get work experience if they won't give you a job? It's an impossible situation. Yes, I know. It's a real problem. And the article says that some people spend a year or more living at home, doing unpaid voluntary work just to get something to put on their CVs. Really boring stuff like photocopying and addressing envelopes. I don't want to do anything like that. I want a real job. It's the elections for the Students' Union Committee posts next month here at the university. All the positions are up for election. Academic officer, sports What's officer... What's your point? And the position of Equal Opportunities Officer is coming up for election. I'm still not sure what you're getting at. Why don't you stand for it? The post starts in June. You're well known at the university, and I think you would be good at it. Equal Opportunities Officer? That sounds great. Isn't that the Students' Union Officer who promotes equality within the university? Yes, that's right. They raise awareness of equal opportunities for everyone in the university and promote the issue around campus. I'd love to do something for women on campus, but what about my studies? It's a paid sabbatical post. Sabbatical? Yes. That means you take a year off and then start your studies again. Meanwhile, you get really good work experience and you can earn money at the same time. That sounds really interesting. But how do I get elected? You go to the Students' Union, fill in an application form and just give it to the Union. Then, I guess, you need to put together a manifesto and try to get people to support you. I'll help you with your campaign and I'll help you with publicity materials like posters for the notice boards and leaflets to hand out to everyone. 
It sounds really exciting. What exactly does the Equal Opportunities Officer do? I'm not really sure. Let's have a look at the Students' Union website. There it is. Hmm. The Equal Opportunities Officer is responsible for anything which concerns women and equal rights and is responsible to the Students' Union Executive Committee for making sure that any racism or sexism is dealt with. Students' Union officers have to be available for students to talk about any problems they have and try to help them. I would love that part of the job, giving help and advice to students. The whole reason I want to work in social services is to help people. That would be very good experience. It's a big responsibility too. It also says that you're in charge of a budget and you would be responsible for managing a team of people. It's good experience for a management position in the future. Now I'm getting really excited. What about the day-to-day -day responsibilities? It says here that the Equal Opportunities Officer acts on any health and safety issues. The Equal Opportunities Officer represents all the students on university committees like the Safety Committee and the Equal Opportunities Committee. Lots of meetings, then. I don't think I would enjoy all those meetings quite so much. My first aid certificate might be useful for safety issues. Very useful. And you would supervise the running of the crash, make sure that students with young children have access to childcare, that sort of thing. Oh, look, the Equal Opportunities Officer also has responsibility for the university bus service. Perhaps I could even get it to run on time. No, don't be too ambitious. We have to get you elected first. Let's take a walk to the union office. Maybe we can meet the Equal Opportunities Officer and talk to her about the job. Great, let's go. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. That's about all I want to say about the course and coursework. As you heard, it's very intensive and there's a lot of work to do. So, how to deal with all the work? It's really important to make sure you have good study skills. It makes the difference between failing, just passing or doing well on any course. There are workshops given by student service counsellors on study skills but I just want to put you in the picture with a quick overview of useful study skills. There are five points I want to make here. The main thing is to get organised. The first thing you need to do, as soon as you get your timetable and reading list, is to draw up a plan of study. Time management is what all students are bad at. Unfortunately, it's what they need to be very good at. Make up a timetable and put in all the things like lab work, lectures, seminars and tutorials that you will attend. Make a note of exactly what work you will do for each of your courses. Where do we get that from? Your lecturer will tell you exactly how you will be assessed at the end of the course. Make sure that you add in time for reading, preparing seminars and so on. Put deadlines into your study plan and put these deadlines into your computer to remind you when they are. With deadlines you need to be realistic and know yourself. Are you the kind of person who leaves things to the last minute? If you are, make sure you remind yourself about deadlines well in advance. Don't leave things to the last minute. That sounds like me. Aim to have a balanced life of academic work, a paid job if you need one, and social activities. As a rough guide, you should be doing 40 hours of academic work per week and 5 to 15 hours for a part-time job, no more. The second point is don't be late or miss lectures. Remember, the person giving the lecture is probably the same person who sets your exams. In lectures, you hear information from the person who will be testing you on it. You will take much longer to gather it from other sources. Classes offer an opportunity to ask questions about difficult material, and you won't miss extra information. Thirdly, make sure that you regularly reread your notes from lectures, books and handouts. This will help you remember what you have done. Finally, two more important points. We expect you to work long hours on your own. 
The information we give you in tutorials and lectures is just a starting point, often comprising the main points of themes of the subject. After this, it's up to you to go into detail about the topic and be familiar enough on certain points to give a seminar on it if asked. The next and last point is this: you need to think about what you read and any information you get on a topic. We are looking for students who can evaluate material critically, students who can think critically. Students who simply read and remember information do not make as good progress as students who think about the subject and form their own opinions on it, based on looking at the subject from all points of view. So we are not just learning facts and figures. Facts and figures are an important part of learning, but not the most important thing. It's what you do with them that is critical. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation about shopping. Masahiro is an international student who has just arrived from Japan, and Anna and Will are doing some shopping with him. You have some time to read questions twenty-one to twenty-six first. Listen to the first part of the conversation now and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Here we are, guys. I'm going to stop by Bergner's first. I might just get lucky today. Who knows? Some of their dresses might be on sale. Bergner's. It's a fairly well-known department store, sort of like Penny's. They've got some quality stuff. Do you want to check it out? Why not? I need to get something for Lisa's birthday. She's into name brands. Any suggestions? A Gucci handbag or a Calvin Klein T-shirt might be nice. Designer perfume is another option. Which reminds me, I have a fifteen percent discount coupon for Learners and Pennies. I hardly ever shop at Learners. I'm not that big on women's clothing. I rarely shop at Pennies. So go ahead and use the coupon if you can. Here they are. Thanks a lot, Will. That's really very thoughtful of you. My pleasure, ma'am. Oh no! I was supposed to give Liz a buzz an hour ago. Hope I have a quarter. Need a nickel? Actually, I don't have anything but pennies in change. Does any of you have a dollar in change? Sorry, I don't. But I do have thirty-five cents on me. Will that be okay for the phone call? Great! I really appreciate it. I'll make it quick. Do you guys want to go ahead? Well, wait. Just don't forget us. I won't. Why don't we just meet here in thirty minutes? Sounds good. I guess I'll just look around. Can I help you, sir? No thanks. I'm just looking. Well, just out of curiosity, how much is that necklace? Twenty nine ninety nine. Really? My sister's birthday is tomorrow. She loves jewellery. I just wasn't sure I could afford it. You'll find that a lot of our stuff is amazingly affordable. Well, that's certainly nice to know. I'll take it. It's a good choice. I'm sure she'll love it. Let's hope so. Cash or charge, sir?、Uh, charge, please. Do you accept Discoverer? Yes, we do. Great. That comes to thirty-one ninety-nine with tax. Please sign next to X. Do you need some help, sir? Well, I'm looking for. Let's see. I've forgotten the name again. It's used to make fresh coffee. A coffee maker. That's right. 
Well, we have a few in kitchenware, which is upstairs. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, there you are, Mashahiro. What did you get? Just a simple coffee maker. Good choice. And you will find anything interesting? A necklace for Stefan's birthday. Lucky her. Did you get anything? Just a couple of silly earrings that I liked. I did a lot of window shopping. That can't hurt. True. Well, do you guys need anything else from this place? One last thing. Oh no, I've forgotten what you call it. Just describe it, and we'll probably figure out what it's called. It's a crystal container for flowers with long stems. I need to get one for my mum. Oh, a vase. That's it. They should have a bunch in giftware. Let's go to get one. I'm going to have to stop by Jewel on my way home. Is that okay with you guys? I'm almost completely out of groceries. No problems. I could pick up a couple of things too. Look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now you will hear the rest of the conversation. As you listen, answer questions number twenty-seven to thirty. Hi, Mashahiro. How's it going? Fine, I guess. How about you? Busy. Guess who's coming our way? Hi, guys. What's up? Nothing much. We just ran into each other. That's nice. So, Mashiro, how's the coffee maker working? Actually, it doesn't work well. It was a waste of money. I guess I should have shopped around for a good one. Why don't you take it back? I'd like to, but I've misplaced the receipt. Well, if it's any consolation, my shopping wasn't all that great either. I wish I'd never bought Stephanie a necklace. Just last night, she was telling me how she wished she had Liz Taylor's new perfume. She did not like my gift at all. That makes three displeased shoppers. Guess what? The camera I bought and shipped to Mike just this morning is now on sale. It's a pity that I bought it then. Then again, I guess I shouldn't complain. It was a good buy, even though I didn't get the best deal on it. Anyway, Mashahiro, I suggest you look for that receipt and just go to the complaints department and say I'd like to exchange this, please. It's as simple as that. And Will, it's not too late for you to ask for a refund. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Listen to the following talk between two friends and answer the questions with no more than three words. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Do you know what, Tom? It won't be long before we'll all be travelling to space in a cable car. A cable car? What do you mean? A sort of sky lift? Well, yes, I suppose so. You must be joking. Where on earth did you get that idea from? Oh, I've just been reading it in a book called. Apes to Astronauts by Adrian Berry. 
He's the science correspondent of the Daily Telegraph, so he should know what he's talking about. He says, wait a minute, I've got it here, page 28. A cable car to the heavens. Oh, honestly, Jane, you surely don't believe all that stuff you read in those sci-fi books? It's not science fiction. It's a fact. Hang on. I'll read you what he says. The space writer, Arthur C. Clarke, to whose inspiration we owe the communications satellite, recently outlined a proposal for a new means of space travel, which, he admitted, is so outrageous that many of you may consider it not even science fiction, but pure fantasy. Shall I go on? No, just tell me how he thinks it could be done. Well, it sounds quite simple, really. One end of a cable... 23,000 miles long. How long? 23,000 miles. Do listen. One end of a cable, 23,000 miles long, would be attached to a point on the Earth's equator and the other to a satellite in geostationary orbit. So? The cable would be absolutely tight between the two points and the elevator would travel up and down, carrying people and freight. According to Arthur Clarke, it's the only way to travel in space without using rocket engines, which would make it much more economical. I wonder if it would be more comfortable. It sounds pretty uncomfortable to me, and heaven knows what speed it would be travelling at. Uh, what would happen if the cable broke? Oh, he explains all that. Apparently, the most likely place for it to break would be at or near the ground. And if that happened, it wouldn't fall down. It would fall upwards. Upwards? Hmm. Yes, I suppose it would. Yes. Sounds funny, doesn't it? Something falling upwards. Anyway, it wouldn't matter too much either if the cable broke away from the high end. It would remain rigid until it could be reattached to the satellite. I don't quite see why. Well, it would be the pull of gravity from above. Anyway, who'd want to be stuck in an elevator attached to a rigid cable thousands of miles up in space? I suppose he doesn't say what would happen if it broke in the middle. Actually, he does. He says it would be dangerous if the break occurred at any altitude up to 15,000 miles because the bit attached to the Earth would... What does he say? Oh, yes collapse and wrap itself around the equator like a whiplash. Whiplash? You know, the long bit of cord or leather on a whip. Anyway, even that would only be really catastrophic if the cable was made of steel or some other metal. Metals are much too heavy. The cable would have to be made of some material capable of suspension without snapping. But I thought you said the cable would be 23,000 miles long. I did, but the 3,000-mile breaking length is because of gravity. Well, all I can say is you'll never catch me going to space in a cable car. I'd rather keep my feet on the ground, thank you very much. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. I thought I had it figured out Believed in us We were meant to be, no doubt A teenage love Everybody else could see The way we were Living in a fantasy When I kiss her I don't know 